one of my very favorite songs, In Christ Alone. Let's preach that message today. Today, let's, if you have your Bibles, would you open them to Acts chapter 20? It's usually at this point I'll tell you where the book of Acts is. I'm thinking about just uh, hiring the Bible drillers and sing, sending them around uh, the sanctuary to find it for you. Uh, we we're proud of them and proud of what they did. But Acts is in the New Testament, which is the second half of your Bible. You find Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the book of Acts. We've been preaching through. Uh, the book of Acts will be in Acts chapter 20 today. Today, as you turn, I don't know how aware you are of Christian culture and evangelical culture and those things in the United States, but there is an entire industry, a multi-million dollar industry in the United States today based on church growth. There are conferences and books and all sorts of things uh, that are focused on how to grow a really large church and have really large numbers and build really large buildings um, and to, to reach out to tremendous amounts of people. And some of their advice is merely cosmetic advice. It's things like uh, don't wear suits when you're preaching and you know, wear blue jeans and things like that. And, and I'll be honest with you, I, I'm actually kind of for that. Um, I'm wearing a suit today because we have the Lord's Supper today, a little bit of service. We, we tend to dress up, uh, but uh, I enjoy wearing blue jeans and t-shirts. But some of the vice is, is cosmetic, like have fog machines and lights and, and wear blue jeans and, and those things. Some of, those, some of the vice, though, is not just cosmetic advice. Some of the vice is core device, and it deals with things like when you preach, don't mention things like sin or the wrath of God or justice because those things tend to turn crowds away. And so if your goal is church growth, you can't talk about things that are going to turn people away. And so this industry has been promoted around this idea that there are certain cosmetic things you can do to improve your attendance. There are certain core things that you can do to improve your attendance. And don't get me wrong, I, I am a creative person. I like being creative. I think part of being made in the image of God is our ability to be creative. However, as much as we are creative, we are not free to change the message of the gospel. We are not free to change the message of Scripture. We proclaim the old, old news of a good, good gospel. And that is exactly what we see today in Acts chapter 20 as, as Paul comes on his missionary journey to a point where he is now beginning to travel back to Jerusalem. He is bound for Jerusalem. He's bound to get there before Pentecost, but he's going to make some stops along the way. And one of those stops he's going to make right outside of Ephesus in the town of Miletus. And he's there to give his farewell speech here in Acts chapter 20. Now, this is a significant sermon for us. This is Paul's first sermon in the book of Acts to believers. Now, he's preached several, uh, several sermons in the book of Acts up to this point, but they've always been to non-believers. They've been to the Pharisees, or they've been to the Areopagus, or they've been to this group or that group. But this is his first sermon, first message to a group of believers. It's also one of his longest messages as well. Miletus is just outside the town of Ephesus, so if you're thinking scripturally, you can think this is the same people that he wrote the book of Ephesians to, and so as he's traveling towards Jerusalem, he's going to stop there to meet with a group of people one last time to give them a farewell speech. Now, we don't know exactly why he doesn't just go on into town into Ephesus, why he stops in this suburb. It could be because he's carrying a lot of money. He's carrying an offering back to Jerusalem, and he's, it could be that he's afraid that he may get mugged or robbed if he goes into town, so he's hanging out in the suburb. It could be that there's some time constraints because he's traveling by boat, and the boat uh, appears to have stopped in Miletus, and so to have the, the time of travel right, he may have had these group of people come to him. We don't know exactly why he doesn't actually go into Ephesus, but he calls a group of people to him to give them a farewell speech and to remind them they are not to abandon the gospel in their preaching or their practice. And that is what I would encourage us today, church, is that we should never, ever abandon the gospel in our preaching or our practice. Now, dive in with me for, for just a moment here in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. 
Now from Miletus, so this is the small suburb of Ephesus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when he came to them, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink or hesitate from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem. Now notice who is sending him and who is warning him to go to Jerusalem. Constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you, none of you among whom I have gone about proclaim the kingdom will see my face again. Did you catch that? This is a farewell speech. You're not going to see me again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from, from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one else's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and those who are with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now go back with me as we look at this passage carefully. This entire farewell speech is Paul's exhortation to the, to the elders of the church not to abandon the gospel in their preaching or in their practice. Now go back and look in verse 17. He's in this suburb of Ephesus and he calls the elders of the church together. Now we have to stop almost immediately and say, now who are these people? Who are these elders? Now in the Greek, these are, the word is presbyteroi, but these are indeed the pastors or the overseers of the church. We have this connection in Scripture right here in this passage as he warns them to look over the flock like a good pastor or shepherd would look over the flock. In Scripture, we know that these elders are assigned with certain tasks. They are assigned the task of teaching the church. We see this in 1 Timothy chapter 3 when we get the description of elders and, and deacons. The only difference in the descriptions in 1 Timothy chapter 3 between an elder and a deacon is that an elder or a pastor must be able to teach. A deacon must be able to serve if you look at the difference in the list. Not only is an elder or a pastor supposed to be able to teach, they're also supposed to be able to lead the church. Hebrews 13 verse 17 tells us of pastors and leaders. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will, give, who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And so they're supposed to lead the church. Now here's what's key. As, as an elder, as a pastor uh, of the church, the destination matters. They're not to lead the church to be simply a great organization or a great business. They're not merely meant to be a CEO. The destination is meant to be maturity in Christ. That's where a pastor or elder should lead a church to be. They're to model Christ. Paul tells them in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, to follow him as he follows Christ. They are to pray for the church. They are not hired hands, nor are they rulers of the church. They're meant to serve the church the way that Christ served the, served the church. Now this term elder may be a little bit different for us, for us as Baptists because we typically in the church have not used this. Now there's two things that have happened. One of them is historically. Historically, 
Baptists abandoned the model of the elder in the early 20th century. You see, as Baptists, and during that time, to much of their shame, abandoned the inerrancy of the word, they went more towards a business model in which the pastor acted as a CEO and the deacons acted as a board of directors. More recently, in the last 30 or 40 years, since the conservative resurgence in the Southern Baptist Convention, they have rediscovered this idea of being multiple elders within the church to do these things, to teach and lead and model and pray for the church into maturity in Christ. Now, indeed, some of you may be sitting there going, yes, we are congregationalists. Absolutely, we are congregationalists. We are not congregationalists, though, because we believe in democracy, Congregationalists is where the church gathers together in business meeting. We gather together to vote to, on the direction of the church. We are congregationalists because we believe in the priesthood of the believer. But the priesthood of the believer does not conflict with this idea of biblical eldership or biblical pastoralship. We see this laid out for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And that is indeed why we gather together as a church to vote and to decide the direction of the church because we believe the members of our church are transformed by Jesus Christ, that each are called to follow and guide and direct in him. But also in 1 Peter just a couple chapters later, we get the exhortation to elders. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Now, in our church, we do have elders, though we don't call them elders, we call them pastors. Technically, in our church, there is an irony of me saying this today on my 35th birthday, I am an elder of this church. <laughs> now, it's more fitting to call Brother Jim an elder of the church. I've been waiting all week to say that. <laughs> but in this church, we do have pastors who function as elders. Myself, Brother Jim, Brother Eric, Brother Ryan. We function as full-time elders of this church. Now, some of you may ask, would it be good to have lay elders? Now, that would be a good thing for our church to pray and to consider as we look at Scripture and certainly I would be all for it if that's the direction the church would want us to go. Now, as we get into this, I know what some of you are saying. I'm really glad I showed up to church today. Because I am not an elder, nor do I feel called to be an elder. Therefore, you're not preaching to me. Let me put my feet under the seat in front of me, my head back, and I will take a good nap today, pastor. But let me remind you of this. Though you may not be called to be an elder, know that you may not serve as an elder. Every single Christian in this room is called to a ministry in Jesus Christ. Every single Christian is called to serve the body of Christ. I may serve it as pastor and elder. You serve it in a different way, but we still serve the same body. We still serve in the name of Jesus Christ. And the exhortation not to abandon the gospel in our preaching or in our practice applies just as much to the pastor or the elder or the church and the church member as it does anyone else who calls themselves by the name of Jesus Christ. And so as we look at Paul's farewell speech, we must understand what he's saying. So he's gathered this group of people together, known as elders or pastors of the church in Ephesus. And as he gathers them together, listen to what he tells them. He, te he, he tells, he warns them to be aware of abandonment of the gospel by neglect in their preaching. Now he reminds them, you know, verse 18, you've watched me this whole time that I was here. You saw, verse 20, how I did not shrink back back from proclaiming the goodness of the God. You, you watched how I, I did not shrink back from proclaiming anything that was pro 
profitable, whether it was teaching in the public or teaching from house to house, I proclaimed all the full counsel of God. And so Paul is, is, is urging them to be consistent in their exhortation. Sometimes that exhortation is going to include hard truth. Sometimes it's going to be comforting. Sometimes, though, we are tempted to water down that message. In other words, sometimes we, we're, we're tempted just to proclaim the love and goodness of God, but neglect the wrath and justice and holiness of God that makes us uncomfortable in church. And yet, this is indeed what Paul did, both through his public proclamation, his private proclamation, and the way that he lived. Paul reminds us of this when he writes a letter to, to the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, he says this, For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. He'll go on to say this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. We do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul never shrunk back or hesitated, proclaiming Jesus Christ as the only way. Now this is, all, this is for us as believers, as Christians, we would rejoice in this message. But proclaiming this message to a lost and dying world is a hard message to proclaim. Because notice here, back in Acts chapter 20, specifically what he's proclaiming in verse 21. We're testifying of the repentance toward, towards God and of faith in our Lord's G, Lord Jesus Christ. Here is what good preaching ought to do. Here is what good teaching ought to do. Here's what good discipleship ought to do when you're sitting down one-on-one -on -one or in your Sunday school class or or in your small group or whether it's in this setting it ought to uh, we ought to proclaim repentance to God and faith in Jesus Christ this is the heart of the gospel in other words let me say it a different way our preaching and teaching and Bible study should drive us to Christ not to self-confidence it should drive us to continually depend upon the grace of God, not upon our good works. Now here's the temptation, because when we sit down on our own and we read the Bible, the very first thing that we want to ask ourselves is this, what does this say about me? Let me give you some freedom today. This book is not about you. It's about God. There is one hero in this book, and it's not me. The hero of this book is Jesus Christ. That is the hero of this book. And so whether we're reading the Bible on our own, or we're discipling one-on-one, -on -one, or we're studying in our small groups, or if the elder pastor is proclaiming the, the Scripture from the pulpit, it ought to proclaim dependence upon God, dependence upon the grace of Jesus Christ, and should never, ever, ever drive us to self-confidence. So if you have one of those TV channels or one of those books that gives you the garbage that says this is your best life now or it's all up to you or you just need to think better of yourself, you need to go home and throw it out the window or <laughs> get rid of it. Because whether it's the elder or the pastor or you studying scripture on your own, we need to make sure we never abandon the good news that we are hopelessly lost, but we have a Savior who has redeemed us, and His name is Jesus. Now, this is no idle temptation to abandon the gospel. There are both external and internal pressures to do this all of the time. For Paul, it was a very real threat he tells us in verse 22 and verse 23 that he's going to Jerusalem. He's constrained by the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit's sending him to Jerusalem. This is for those of you that think God would never ask you to do anything dangerous. The Holy Spirit's sending him to Jerusalem and also telling him in verse 23 that when he gets there, he's going to face 
afflictions and imprisonment. The reason he's going to face afflictions and imprisonment is because he's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because he's proclaiming that the Jews need to turn to Jesus, he is going to suffer for it. This is no idle understanding that there is a temptation by us to constantly abandon the gospel. There, is, there are e- internal pressures within us. There is a part of us that wants to believe it can't be true. Now, I think that's part of our sinful nature. That's part of our, the wickedness of our hearts. There's some of you here today, you, maybe you come from a religious background that teaches you it's Jesus plus something else. Maybe some of you come from, maybe you're, you're an atheist or you're an agnostic or you're a doubter. We are so glad you're here today. And maybe you've heard the gospel and you say, it simply can't be that easy as it is to trust in Jesus Christ. I think there's something inside of us that constantly wants to pull us away from the truth of the good news. That's what gospel means. It is not something you do. It is good news. It is a declaration of what God has done, not what you need to do. And so there's something in us that wants to go, I don't believe that. So there are constant internal pressures that draw us away from that. But there's also external pressures as well. I will share with you the ones that I struggle with personally. If there hasn't already been a Sunday where this has happened, there will be a Sunday in which it will come. One day, I'm going to preach from a passage in Scripture. And one day, the message which I have to proclaim is going to be difficult for you to hear. The temptation on my heart would be to change the message, to make it sound just a little bit softer, just a little bit weaker, just a little bit more watered down, so no one gets mad and no one gets upset with me so so that I don't lose my job. It's one thing if I'm a jerk in the pulpit. But it's another if I'm simply standing up here and proclaiming the message of Scripture. And the temptation to change it just so slightly is ever present. And yet we are called to be watchmen of the gospel. Paul reminds us in this farewell speech that he is going to finish the course of his race, that he's proclaimed the fullness of the gospel in verse 26, so that he's innocent of the blood of all. We read at the beginning of our service from Ezekiel chapter 33, in which God tells Ezekiel that he is a watchman to declare the news of God. In other words, he tells Ezekiel, he says, Ezekiel, I'm going to give you a message, and if you don't proclaim it and they die, their iniquity is still on them, their, their sin is still on them. But guess what? You're going to be responsible for not proclaiming the message I told you to proclaim. I want you to know I take that responsibility seriously. Every Sunday I preach and every Sunday that you're here, if I don't proclaim the message of God, there's something seriously wrong. God has called me to be a watchman, to proclaim his word, to proclaim his truth. Whether, it's we, whether we study on our own or we study in a small group or we study in discipleship or we study together as a church, you and I must proclaim the message of God as he has given it to us. This is part of proclaiming, verse 27, the whole counsel of God. And Paul says, I'm innocent because I proclaimed the whole counsel of God. As we look at scripture, we proclaim it. Now this is why we preach through books of the Bible. This is why our typical normal preaching is to simply walk through books of the Bible because we don't want to neglect any of it. We want to declare the grand story of God, the plan and purpose of God. You understand from Genesis to Revelation, there is one simple story that God is the creator of all mankind, that God is the creator of all things, that man rebelled against him, fell into sin, but God sent a rescue mission and that rescue mission came in in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, and now he's recreating us in his, in his image and glorifying him. If we don't preach and teach and study this way, the temptation is to only study the things that are easy for us, only the things that we like. And so when we look at Scripture, sometimes the things that we only focus on are the love and goodness of God. And we neglect things like wrath and justice and holiness. This is the, inhibit- this is, this is the shackles of expository preaching upon us. The reason we preach expositorily, not suppositorily, (laughs) expositorily, 
there's a big difference between the two. Is simply because we want to proclaim the whole counsel of God. You see, expository preaching is not simply just getting up and, and reading a text of Scripture and then talking about whatever I want to talk about. Expository preaching is preaching so that the main point of the sermon is the main point of the text. That is an expository sermon. And when we do that, when we go and say, what is the purpose of this text? What is the purpose of this scripture? I can't ride my hobby horse. The temptation to study scripture apart from this way, the temptation to study scripture away from this is to only look at verses we like. To only look at verses we think matter to us. And yet we should study and preach and declare and disciple in such a way that we preach the main point of the text in its entirety. And so we forsake other means as worldly wisdom and give them up. You will hear me preach lots of sermons on marriage. But you will never hear me preach 10 ways to improve your marriage. I will preach as we come to passages on Scripture about marriage. You will hear me preach about all sorts of issues in life as Scripture addresses and deals with them because I believe that God has given us everything we need in this book. I hope you hear me on this, church. I don't know how long God's going to let me be your pastor. Today is my 35th birthday. I'm not guaranteed another birthday. Now, don't get me wrong. I really hope I die here. I, I want to be here 50, 60 years. But that may not be the case. God may take me home. But before I go, I hope to ruin this church on the word of God in such a way that you will never be satisfied with anything else ever again. We need to be aware of other forms of, of preaching and teaching that abandon the gospel by neglect. Not only do we need to be aware of abandoning the gospel by neglect, but we also need to be aware of abandoning the gospel by abuse through our practice. Paul, after exhorting them to proclaim the gospel, tells them in verse 28, Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock and what the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church. He warns them to pay attention to their self, lest they unsay with their life what they say with their mouth. And that is a temptation among us as a church, as, as, as followers of Jesus Christ, to unsay with our life what we say with our mouth. Paul reminds them of his, his example and their servant leadership and the humility and following Paul as he follows Christ. Here's the great thing about Paul and, and the temptation that I want to make sure that we avoid as we study great people in church history. When people look to Paul, they never said how great Paul was. They always said how great Paul's God was. Because Paul led them by example to follow Jesus Christ. And he points out to them to live in such a way that they minister to all the flock, both Jews and Greeks. In verse 21, this is my desire as a pastor. Can I simply say this, church, to you as we come to this passage and as we want to care for the flock? You are my flock. Sometimes I say it this way. You are my people. I love you. I love you. I would never, ever want to hurt you. I want to be there for you as your pastor. And sometimes it grieves me at being only one person among only being able to be in one place at one time that I can't be there for everybody all the time. But I want you to assume this. As pastors of your church, and I think I can speak for Brother Ryan and Brother Jim and Brother Eric as well. I know I can speak for Misty and Lee. We love you. We want to be there for you. Please assume that we care. And we can't be everywhere at one time. We can't be in all the places at one time. And we can't know everything at, that's going on. But know this. If you pick up a phone and you call us, we're there for you. Because we love you. You are our flock. And this is the task that God has put on my life. 
I love you because you're God's church. Now notice the Trinitarian formula that takes place here. As he tells them, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Notice the Trinity. In what the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. We have the Spirit, we have God, we have the blood of Jesus Christ. This Trinitarian formula of God working through his church. This ought to give you a magnitude of the cost for us to be here today. Now I also know the temptation for us as a church. The temptation is to say, I don't like organized religion. You know, I like my relationship with Jesus, but I'm not real big on the organized religion and the church. And I, I'm not going to join the church. I'm not going to be a member of the church. But, but I, all of those things. Understand this. In order for us to be a body of believers, for us to be brothers and sisters in Christ, in order for us to be forgiven of our sins, in order for us to be reconciled to God and to one another, it took the blood of Jesus. That cost was precious. And because that cost was precious, this church is precious to me. I would never neglect the church in the same way I would never neglect Jesus Christ. But there's a danger in it. He warns them to watch out for fierce wolves that will come among them and not spare the flock. Now I want to warn us here before we even begin to dive into what a wolf is. Sometimes it's easier to demonize people than it is to deal with them. In other words, sometimes it's easier for us to look at someone and go, oh, you're just, you're just a wolf, I'm not going to have anything to do with you, than it is to love them patiently and graciously in Jesus Christ. This is, that is not what this warning is about. This warning is not demoni about demonizing people to dismiss them. This warning is about abusing the gospel through the practice of our life or the neglect in our preaching. In other words, Paul warns them that when I leave, these wolves are going to come and they're going to do certain things. They're going to try to take you away from Jesus. They're going to twist scripture. They're going to distort the gospel and they're going to draw disciples to themselves. Now, we've seen this in our very own culture. We have today in our own culture people who are worshiping celebrity Christians more than they are worshiping Jesus Christ. Jesus warns us of wolves in Matthew chapter 7. and says, you will know them by the fruit of their life. That is part of my job as your shepherd. My job is to encourage you, sometimes to rebuke you in your sin, to feed you, to warn you, to help you grow in grace, and to protect you from wolves. Now, I am thankful that in our church, as far as I know, we have no wolves in our church right now, as far as I know. But the day will come in which a wolf will try to come. And we need to understand in our church that we don't abandon the gospel either in our preaching or in our practice. Sin constantly tries to distort and to divide. It brings about tyrants and bullies who would destroy the lambs of God. But let us be a people who don't chase after the wolves who distort the gospel, but a people who grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that scares me. That scares me because it seems to be like an impossible task. It seems to be impossible because this church is full of sinful people, including the guy standing at the pulpit. This is why I love that Paul finishes his farewell speech with this. In verse 32, he says, And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He reminds them that this impossible, impossible task is done by God. Yes, I am a shepherd of this church, but God is the ultimate shepherd. God is the ultimate watchman. God is the ultimate protector. God is the ultimate builder of his church. And we have his word of grace. We have the gospel that affirms us and assures us and encourages us to finish strong. This is why we testify to the grace of God. 
Now, how do I know that this encourages me and affirms me to testify to finish strong? Can we just be honest with each other while we finish up today? All those who are awake, that this is yes, this is no. <laughs> There's been a lot of times in my life I've felt like giving up on the church. People have hurt me, people have abused me. Felt like people didn't care. There's been other times in my life where I've had sin in my life. And I thought, there's no way I can go back to church. There's no way I can walk through those doors. I'm not worthy to continue on in my walk of Christ, with Christ. There's been lots of times that I've wanted to quit. But you know what keeps bringing me back? It's not that I picked myself up by my bootstraps and said, I'm just going to keep on keeping on. That's not what has brought me back. What has brought me back is the sure and firm assurance that in Christ alone, I am saved and redeemed from all my sins. And because Christ has redeemed me, because Christ has forgiven me, because it is by His grace, it gives me confidence and strength to continue on. It gives me the blessed hope that if God can forgive me, <laughs> then I can forgive anybody. It gives me the hope that when I walk through the doors, the building's not going to fall apart because of the sinner I am. It's going to stand because of who God is. So Paul reminds him, you have this impossible task ahead of you. But I commend you to God who's done it all. And it is by His grace that you will stand. So believers today, let us be the type of believer that forsakes all other means and preaches and teaches and affirms and lives out the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that's what Paul means here as he finishes up. He says, you know how I've worked among you. You know how I've been there. You know how I've tried to live out. It's more blessed to give than to receive as Christ commands. I've done this because not because of who I am, but because of who Jesus is. I work hard not because of what I'm trying to do, but because of what Christ has done. Church, let us be that type of church. Let us be these type of believers. And as far as your elders and your pastors are concerned, let us be this type of pastor and teacher in this church. Unbeliever, you are not a part of the flock. You're a goat. You're not a sheep. And I don't mean that as an insult. Those are the words of Christ. You see, when he returns, he's going to separate us. On one side will go his sheep, and on the other side will go his goats. His sheep will spend eternity with him, glorifying his Father. His goats will go to eternal destruction in a place we called hell. I would not be a good watchman today if I did not warn you of that. So please do not get me wrong. I do not finish my sermon out telling you that today out of pride or arrogance or gladness. I tell you that today as a one beggar trying to tell another beggar where to find bread. We want you to be part of the flock. And that only happens through trust in Jesus Christ. We hope today is the day that you become one of the sheep and you stop being a goat. Let's pray. Father.